Hey guys, welcome back to the channel. This is Steve. Today I want to talk about the top eight things I've learned after being an audiophile, a music file, I will say, a music lover for 35 years. Building a system, I've built many systems over the years, I've had many pieces of gear, I've made mistakes, I've learned lessons, but if you're just getting started into high-end audio or even you know, mid-fi audio where it can get rather expensive as well, um, maybe you're new to this, maybe you're not sure of the things you should be doing to make your system the best it can be, but these are the eight things I've learned over my 35 years in hi-fi. Right off the bat, we'll start with number eight, measurements. Now, there's a particular part of the audiophile audience or the music lover audience that reads reviews and they like to see measurements of the gear. Some gear measures incredibly well. Some gear measures incredibly bad, right? Um, but does that really convey to the listening experience? I have had pieces in my system that were reviewed uh, by measurements as being horrible and god awful and nothing you would want to buy and and it may have been a favorite piece of mine it sounded glorious i have had pieces that measured superbly and they sounded sterile and lifeless so never buy gear based on measurements in reviews measurements can tell you uh certain things to your mind right oh i'm reading this and it doesn't look very good but that measurement may be totally different when it comes to the sound quality within your room and within your system. Just because a piece of gear might not uh, measure perfectly, that doesn't mean it's going to be a bad piece of gear. In fact, some of my favorite pieces of gear are those that have not measured very well. It all depends on what it sounds like to the best measurement tool in the world. And you know what that tool is? Our ears right here. When it comes to hi-fi and listening to music, the only measurement tool that matters to me anyway are right here, my ears. Okay, number seven, cables. Now, uh, when I started in hi-fi, uh, cables were just the thin, you know, copper see-through stuff you buy at your local Walmart or Best Buy. There wasn't a huge market for cables when I was getting into hi-fi. Uh, when I was a teenager, I bought the cheapest cables from um, the local hardware store or electronic store, and I was happy. You know, I didn't have an audiophile system at 15. I had a two channel stereo system that I put together. I think at the time it cost me $1,500, which is a lot of money when you're young, but I remember always saving, saving, saving to buy things I wanted. Now, these days, we have tons of cables to choose from. There's the cheap cables, $30 for a spool of speaker wire. You can also pay $40,000 for two runs of eight feet speaker cable. It's absolutely insane, the choices, the prices, and the way cables have become so exotic in hi-fi. Um, it's easy to demystify though. Now, cables do make a difference. I know this without question. I've passed blind tests with cables, not all cables, but certain cables. Um, and what I have found after being allowed to and being blessed enough to be able to try cables ranging from $100 up to that $40,000 range, I didn't care for the uber expensive cables. Cables do matter, but you don't have to buy the crazy exotic stuff or even lust after that crazy exotic stuff because once you get to a price point I've found of thirty, forty thousand dollars for a set of speaker cables, those cables are made for a specific audience, a specific niche who has money to burn and they will buy it because they can. And that doesn't mean that that cable is better because honestly, there could be a cable that's a hundred dollars that's better within your system because it all depends on the synergy of your components and your room. My rule of thumb is I spend, I think it's about 15 to 20% of what my entire system costs. That's my budget for cables, right? They can clean up the sound. They can deepen the, the blackness of the backgrounds. 
They can expand the sound stage and the detail and just give a more effortless flow to the music because these cables are carrying an electronic signal, right? But I have discovered you don't need the crazy exotic stuff. Uh, I'm happy in the, you know, middle of the road when it comes to cables. But I like to spend, I'd say, 15% of my total system cost on cables, and I've never been let down. Now, in my system, now I'm running Cardis Clear Reflection cables, and for fun, I took them all out and put in some cheap, you know, inexpensive cables. The system still sounded pretty good, but I lost that all-out transparency and... Um, the life that those cables bring to the system. And I'm talking interconnects, I'm talking speaker cables, I'm talking power cables. Don't have to go crazy, but cables do make a difference. If you have a system you put in tons of money into and you're running cheap, crappy speaker cables and interconnects, audition, try to audition a set of decent quality cables and you might be surprised. I have found in my experience I've gained the biggest differences from interconnect cables. I remember going from an AudioQuest Water to a uh, Valhalla 2 or even a Valhalla 1 from Nordist, and it was just simply night and day. My son, me, Debbie, we all noticed the differences instantaneously when switching just those interconnects in the system. When you have a highly resolving um, system that sounds good and you spent money on all the the components and you have time invested, do also think about cabling. Um, but be sure to check out, maybe go to your dealer and try out some cables and you'll see what the differences are. Now, when you put something in such as cables, it might take a couple of days, leave them in for a couple days, a few days and listen. And then when you switch back to your old ones, that's when you're gonna notice the difference uh, of what you're gaining from the new to the old. Maybe you like the old ones better. That's also a possibility. But do invest in decent cables when you invest a lot of time and money into your two-channel system. Cables have a way of finishing off the system and polishing it off and refining everything, right? So uh, some cables out there lean to the bright side, the thin side, the lean side, the fat side, the dark side. They all bring a little bit of a different flavor to your system depending on the brand the house sound of each brand. So cables make a difference, period. Number six, synergy is key. Synergy within an audio system, you may have heard about that before. That is massively important. For example, if you're building a system and you want something that's going to have a rich, harmonically textured, a little bit warm, big, a beautiful sound that envelops you when you listen, you're not gonna want to buy components or mix and match components that uh, have a tendency to be bright or fast or, or excitable, right? You're gonna wanna pick your components carefully. And what I have found is with Synergy, if you buy components, even I'm talking even cabling. Um, for example, if you're buying an amplifier and a preamp, I like to stick with the same brand because those products are made to work together and they will synergize very well. Then you have to find speakers that synergize with your amp or preamp. Or if you're going with an integrated amp, um, there are many out there and they all have different sounds. Not hugely different, but they do have different characters, a different house sound. I love Pass Labs because they offer transparency, beauty, depth, meat on the bones, if they're not lean, uh, sparkle, they offer amazing bass. They have everything I want in one, but I also like brands such as Luxman, who Macintosh amplifiers have a totally different sound. They're more of a direct sound. They don't do all of those audiophile things as well as some of the other brands. So synergy with your amplification, with your cables, with your speakers, with your DAC, it all matters and it takes time. I went through so much trial and error in the old days. I remember once I had a, um, a Sonic Frontiers set of tube mono blocks. I believe they were only 40 watts per channel and I was looking for a preamp and I just bought something on AudioGone maybe 20 years ago now 
and it was a Pass Labs, one of their early, early, early two-piece, um, I believe it was a two-piece, maybe it was a one-piece uh, preamps, but it was old. I don't see these anymore, and I don't remember the model number, but I remember hooking it up, and it just sounded awful. It was flat, made my speaker sound like cardboard, like I had blankets thrown over them. There was no life. And I was like, what's going on? Is this broken? But it turns out they just didn't synergize very well, right? So you want to have a preamp that really synergizes with your amp, but you really want speakers that synergize with the rest of the system. My speakers right now, the Fleetwood DeVilles, which are absolutely incredible. Uh, they just seem to get better and better each day. Um, they are a big kind of slightly warm, uh, nice bass, a uh, beautiful big sound, but I don't want to partner those with an overly warm amp or overly warm DAC, right? Because then it will be too much of a good thing. I don't want to partner them with a lean sounding set of components because then it's too lean. I'm running these speakers with Pass Labs monoblocks that are a little bit warm, but they also are stunning in their transparency, in their sparkle, in their imaging. Um, they have just enough neutrality to make the slightly warm DeVilles just open up and sound glorious, right? Uh, Dax, I'm running a Pontus II from Dana Fripps, which is a warm, I've discovered more recently, it's really a warmer leaning DAC. It does details, but it's more musical. When I swap in a Chord Dave into the system, things get uber detailed, but also really musical and just bigger and more explosive and dynamic. The Pontus is musical and fluid. The Dave is just stunning in the way it presents the music to you with that electric energy and that detail and the three-dimensionality. They're different, but they both sound beautiful. When you're buying comp components, make sure you stay in the price range of your other components. Don't buy a $10,000 preamplifier and a $500 amp. Don't buy a $20,000 set of speakers and then run it with a $300 receiver. So synergy is key. Try to match everything together so it sounds its best. And again, that's going back to the cables as well. All right, number five, your room, your listening space, where you have your system set up is going to make or break said system. I used to have to put my systems in a living room, right? Or, or, or a space in the house that was shared with other things or had other purpose. Um, and it never, when I had it in the living room, it just never gave me that full out magic like I started getting when I had a dedicated room. But even if you have a dedicated room, the size matters. Uh, where you place your speakers matter immensely. Um, but the room size, the way you have the room uh, dampened or filled with furniture matters. If you have a dedicated space, for example, mine is 13 by 18 now. And my speakers are in the back on the short wall, which they'd be better on the long wall, but the way the room is laid out, I have them on the short wall. They're maybe three feet out from the back. They're a foot and a half from the sides. And it took me days of experimenting with placement in that room to get everything to lock in. Um, I guess you have to decide, do you want your system for background music or critical listening in a sweet spot? When you have a sweet spot, you want to dial those speakers in perfectly until the sound just locks into place your sound stage is set, you hear the instruments where they're supposed to be, that's when you know you have everything set up right. When you don't have any um, booming bass or issues with bass or, or a treble that is overly excited or you're getting ringing or you're getting a dull sound, these are problems that can actually be fixed with your room. If you're in an empty room and your system sounds echoey and bright, Throw a carpet if you have hardwood floors. Put some uh, you know, things on the wall. Throw a blanket over the couch or some pillows. Um, these things really can help with tuning your system. If your system sounds too dull and, and muddled and boring, 
your room might be overdamped. Start taking stuff out if you have too many blankets or furniture or carpeting or drapes, right? In my room, I have hardwood floors, wood walls, wood ceiling, and I have big windows, but those windows have big shades that pull all the way to the floor if I want them, and those kind of act as diffusion. I also have a big, huge carpet that almost covers the whole um, 13 by 18 space. Um, I have a couch, I have pillows, um, I have a couple of other things on the walls, and my room does not need in any way, shape, or form any kind of treatment, right? Because there are services, there are things you could spend a lot of money on to treat your space. Some people need that to get the sound to lock into their satisfaction. I have zero ringing, zero echo, zero bass issues, zero treble issues, no issues whatsoever in my space. And that is because I tuned it with the furniture, the flooring, and the walls. And you can do that at home. The room though is important. But I would say, unless you can build a dedicated room for your stereo, I wouldn't spend a fortune on said stereo because you're only really gonna get the most from it in a dedicated space that you treat yourself or have someone treat and critical speaker setup and positioning. Okay, fourth thing I've learned in my time with Hi-Fi, diminishing returns is very, very real. Now, diminishing returns means um, if, if I spend $1,000 for a CD player DAC, and I love it, right? It sounds great, it's, it's doing great, but then I wonder, well, what does this $15,000 CD player slash DAC sound like? Let's just say DAC. Let's just say a $2,000 DAC versus a $15,000 DAC. Um, are you going to get $13,000 worth of improvement in the $15,000 DAC over the $2,000 DAC? Absolutely not. Um, you'll probably get five to 10% improvement. Uh, for example, I'm using the Pontus DAC and the Chord Dave, two wildly different DACs, two wildly different price points. I love both of them. The Dave is, is a superior DAC without question. It does detail better, soundstage better. Um, it does 3D much better. It does um, the micro details, the macro details much better. But it might not be as musical as the Pontus II, right? I'm getting an improvement in the Dave, but is it an, an improvement I really want? So just because you spend a lot of money for something, doesn't mean it's going to give you 10 or 20 times the performance jump. Yes, higher end products that are made really well and have a good reputation, not all do, will sound better and give you more refinement, quieter backgrounds, more detail over something that costs less. The, the lesser item will have um, you know, less noise filtering, it will use cheaper parts, and you might hear a little graininess here and there in the lower end deck, but if you're spending $13,000 more, you're not really getting $13,000 more dollars worth of performance. You're getting maybe five to 10%. And if you're going from a 15,000 DAC to a 30,000 DAC, you might get another three to 5% increase in performance. So diminishing returns is real. The more you spend, the more you go up the hi-fi ladder, You'll get improvements, but those improvements will get smaller and smaller as you go up the ladder. So it's always best to find what you're comfortable with spending. Set a budget and try not to break it, but don't go too cheap. You don't want to cheapen out um, because then you'll just want to upgrade later. Spend as much as you can afford and um, know that if you're, you know, fantasizing about this next upgrade that costs you $10,000 more dollars, doesn't mean it's going to be an upgrade in your system. So diminishing returns is very real. And you, and you don't have to spend a fortune, 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 fortune to get an amazing world-class system. The next thing I've discovered is the most important aspect of my systems that have brought the biggest differences, the biggest change in sound quality, the biggest improvements in sound quality, has been by me investing more in the front end, the source, right? So in this case, if you're listening to digital, if you're streaming Tidal Cobas, or you're pulling stuff off of a hard drive with a server, 
whether you're using Rune uh, to stream or whatever, your digital front end is very important and that's going to make a huge impact or, or what you put in that position of your, say, streamer and DAC is going to make a huge difference in what your system sounds like. As I mentioned, my system sounds completely different just by switching the Pontus 2 DAC to the Core Dave DAC. Totally different sounding speakers. It's actually pretty crazy. Um, so I have discovered that something like the DAC, uh, or it used to be the CD player and DAC, um, makes the biggest difference. To me, streamers haven't made a huge, huge difference. They've made small differences, so I'm happy with my Lumen U1 Mini. Um, but the DACs I've been experimenting with have been making massive differences, even more so than changing a preamp or an amplifier, at least in my experience. So I always, these days, um, say invest as much as you can in the source. Now, if you're analog, I have also discovered you're going to have to spend a heck of a lot more in your analog front end than your digital if you want to beat the sound of modern day digital because digital these days is so, so good when you have a really decent streamer or DAC. And I have found that it costs way more to set up a competent Vinyl rig if you're talking I'm talking about audiophile here not just for listening for fun or listening for background Critical listeners here. I'm talking to you. You're gonna have to spend a lot more in the analog realm to beat a digital uh, for the equivalent price I'd say probably almost triple double or triple in my experience. I have a beautiful turntable the the dr. Fikert Valari I have a pretty pricey cartridge, a Koetsu Black. I have a pretty pricey Phono preamp that I'm using here, um, a Pass Labs XP15. And it doesn't even get close to the sound of my digital with the Chord Dave or even the Pontus 2. It just doesn't. 90% of my records sound nowhere near as good as what I'm getting from digital. I think I'd have to spend double of what I spent on the analog setup to match my digital, and that's not going to happen for me. Um, so be prepared to spend more in analog, but the source is extremely important when it comes to the performance and sound that you're going to get out of your system and speakers. Next up, speaker size, big or little. Now, I've always loved small bookshelf speakers. I loved I love their ability to be able to disappear in the room and make it sound like the music is just coming from almost like the air has many speakers and you can't pinpoint where those speakers are. The thing though with bookshelf speakers that usually lack is the bass performance. Some of them pack a mighty punch like the Dyn Audio Special 40s or the Dyn Audio Heritage Specials. They can pack a serious punch when it comes to bass but they still don't have that body and size and scale of a bigger speaker. But you don't want to get this big old speaker and put it in a tiny room because then that can overwhelm the space and you could run into issues with bass boom or, or the room sucking out your treble and it can just cause all kinds of issues. So if you're in a small room, say I used to be in a 12 by 12 room and I always had bookshelf speakers in there. Uh, when I put big speakers, it just overwhelmed the room a little too much. In my 12 by 18 room I have now, the DeVilles by Fleetwood are a perfect size. They're, they're pretty big. They're not a bookshelf speaker, but they are just big enough to give the, the scale and the body and the size of the images in that room. If I were to put big Wilson tall towers in there, it would be too much for the room. So always pick the speaker size for the size of your room and you will get the best performance. I see, I see some people, I, I had a friend once who had a small, maybe it was like a 12 by 15 space, a bedroom, and he wanted to put an audio system in there. He bought these massive like they were, I don't know what they were vintage, but they were huge boxes. Uh, maybe they were even bigger than Cornwalls. And he put them in there and it was just too much. It was just, he was trying to run them with a receiver, which was on the lower end and it was just harsh. 
and it was glaring and it just did not work. He later uh, bought some small bookshelf speakers that were relatively affordable and it transformed the sound of the system because the speakers matched the size of the room. So if you're in a small room, stay with small to medium sized speakers. If you're in a big space, the bigger the speaker, the better. Okay, I know I hinted at it a little bit when talking about the room, but speaker positioning is also key. It goes along with the room. Make sure you set up your speakers. Pull them out from the wall if you can. Pull them out from the sides. Tow them in to the right angle. Um, and once you mess with it, it can take two, three, four, six hours to get this right. But once you start messing with the placement of the speakers, you're gonna sit there and go back in your spot and be like, that's it, it's just locked in. You'll know when it's locked in. Speaker positioning is very, very important. Keep them, don't push them against the walls. Um, don't put a bunch of stuff in between them. Don't put one in front and one on the side wall, right? If you're trying to set up a system for critical listening or, or listening and where you can meld into your chair for hours and be taken away by the music. Speaker positioning will also, just like the room, make or break the sound of a system. So a long time ago, I drove to Canada to buy some Paradigm speakers. Um, and they were big towers. I don't, I don't remember the model number. It was a long, long time ago. And I had a Marantz um, integrated amplifier that at the time I thought was super cool, but looking back, it was probably not the best model. But either way, I had it in my home. I put it in the basement and it sounded really good. I'd play a lot of rock music at the time and meet my son and I, he was little, we'd dance and jam out to it. And I was like, this sounds really good for what I paid for it. I moved, we moved and I put that system into a smaller bedroom and I was really, I didn't have the freedom to set it up or pull them away from the walls or do any of that. So I put them on each side of, a, of an entertainment center that our TV was on, plugged in the amp and it sounded horrible. There was no bass, there was no mid range. It sounded like something had broken, um, but that wasn't the case. I moved everything out into another room and set it up as I would and it sounded really good. So speaker placement can make or break your system, period. Part of the fun is doing all of this stuff, right? Because it, and that's how I learned by spending hours placing speakers. These days when I get a new set, I pretty much can envision in my mind where they're gonna go and that's usually where they end up. Um, it comes with experience. So setting up the speakers will transform the sound of your system. Don't stress over the gear all the time. Remember to enjoy the music because that's what we're in this for in the first place. We get into this to build a system because we wanna to listen to high quality music and get lost in it. For me, it distresses me, it puts me in a better place. And it's something that I do every single day. I listen to music every single day. That's what it's about. But sometimes I get lost and I'm, it becomes about the gear and I start browsing the internet and shops like Music Direct or, or Audiogon or The Music Room or I check in with dealers that I know. And when I do that, I see something that I, I start to get the itch. I'm like, you know, the itch that you get when you wanna try something new because it's really also a hobby. And we might be totally satisfied with our system but that doesn't eliminate us wanting to try something new, right? Um, but what I've learned is you have to let go of that sometimes and just enjoy the music, have fun. Don't always worry about what's next or what may be better because in fact, you might get something that you think is better and it's worse because there is no better or worse. No matter how much you spend, it's just different. It's just gonna change the sound so focus on the music, focus on the fun, the enjoyment, and try not to worry so much about the gear. Enjoy what you have. If you enjoy what you have and you like what's coming out from it, live with it for a while and enjoy it. These days, as of today, the end of 2021, I no longer am lusting after speakers or amplifiers or even a DAC or cables. I am pretty much where I wanna be uh, once I decide on the final DAC. But after that, when my DAC is in, I, I am happy with every single aspect of my system. And it's like my camera that I've had for a couple years, no desire to change 
There's nothing in my system that I desire to change for my personal listening. I'll still review items. I'll still evaluate items and talk about them. But my reference system is 95% complete. Those are my tips. Those are the things I've learned in 35 years of hi-fi. It's really about room, speaker positioning. Um, synergy is 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 very important. It's about being happy with the music. I, I could never be without a high quality two channel stereo system. So have fun if you're buying your next piece of equipment or assembling a system from scratch. Um, tell me in the comments below what you have. What are you running? What do you like? Um, let me know. It'd be fun to read. So thank you all. If you like this, thumbs up and subscribe and I will see you next time. I'll have a review of the Cord Dave DAC versus the Pontus II uh, coming up here pretty soon. Uh, next year, I'll have a review of the Luxman 595 AE. I think it's, yeah, the Anniversary Edition uh, Integrated Amplifier. That's coming to me early next year from Luxman, so look out for that as well, a little while away, but just wanna let you know what's up and coming. And I'll have a few more videos in the hi-fi realm here very soon. I thank you all. I love you all. I will see you next time. Bye. Uh -huh.